Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the webinar this evening, which has been hosted by AHDV Beef and Lamb. My name's Chloe McKee, and I'm the Knowledge Transfer Officer for Beef and Lamb. And I'm pleased to bring you tonight's webinar on the Ram Compare 2020 project results. Our speaker tonight is Sam Boone, and Sam works for HDB as the Signet Manager. And I'll, um, I'll leave it to Sam to introduce himself once he begins the presentation. So the plan of action tonight is that Sam will run through a 30 minute presentation and then there will be time for questions at the end. You will all stay muted throughout the webinar, but if you'd like to ask a question at any time, then please type your question into the box on the side of your screens. You may need to click on the arrow to open this box up and you can type in your question at any time during the webinar. There'll also be plenty of time to think of questions at the end. So hopefully there won't be any technical difficulties tonight, but please bear with us if there are any. So, um, Sam, I'll hand over to you. Well, thank you very much, Chloe, and uh, a very warm welcome from Warwickshire, uh, and welcome to tonight's presentation on Year 4 RAM Compare results. I shall introduce myself in a moment, but before I start, I do just want to acknowledge the tremendous support that we've had for this project. I fully realise this is an AHDB webinar, but the project's been funded by AHDB, HCC, QMS, AgriSearch and Sainsbury's with a massive amount of input from Dumbia and Randall Parker and uh, a stream of dedicated farmers that supply them. In addition to which, we've got a lot of collaborators and supporters within the industry that have helped us along the way. So this is truly a project that's involved the entire supply chain and we're very grateful for that uh, support. So there we go, I'll do my thank yous first so I don't forget at the end. Right, so uh, I'm Sam Boone. I'm the manager of Signet Breeding Services. Uh, that means I oversee the delivery of sheep recording services for about 500 flocks, of about 30 different breeds, as well as a number of beef herds. And I'm also part of AHDB's breeding and genetics team. So at the moment, I'm spending quite a bit of my time educating clients about the new Signet website which allows them uh, full access to online recording and uh, enables them to do their own reports, which at this current moment in time is uh, very useful indeed. We're also developing new services to help put commercial producers in touch with uh, breeders that have performance recorded stock. Now, be under no illusion that it's actually Bridget Lloyd, who's the project manager, that does all the real work uh, in the project, liaising between farmers and abattoirs and breeders and myself. Uh, she's done a fantastic job. She'll be helping me on the Q&A tonight. Um, she's also on the Twitter account, for those of you that are involved in social media. She's on at Ram Compare, uh, and she'll also be presenting if the phone line goes down, which I know she's looking forward to immensely. So that's just a quick acknowledgement. Of the things I wanted to talk about this evening, uh, really three elements. Firstly, is to explain the project, uh, what we're doing, why we're doing it, why it's important. And secondly, to talk about just a few of the things that we've learned, particularly in the, the last year. And finally, I'm going to talk about a few of the season's highlights, um, some of the leading rams within the booklet that was launched today. So what is RAM Compare? Well, it's a national progeny test for terminal sire breeds. So very similar to those that have been run in New Zealand and Australia and Ireland uh, in recent years. What we do is we put a range of RAMs of known genetic merits, so recorded RAMs that we already know quite a bit about, onto a series of commercial farms. And then we record the information on their progeny. Uh, at the start of the project, we were really fortunate to work with some fantastic group of farmers. Uh, and year on year, they've gone above and beyond to make this project work. Uh, I know a chunk of them will be listening tonight, and quite a few are on Twitter as well. So um, it's nice to acknowledge uh, their massive contribution when we talk them into it. Uh, we selected the farmers uh, based on uh, uh, the uniformity of uh, their sort of ewe flock. So they had uh, genetically similar use um, across the, the flock. So have to have at least 350 of them. And actually over time, they've tended to put more and more use into the project. So we've actually got a lot more lamb data than we initially thought. 
um, use of known health status coming from predominantly forage based systems. That's the Liz Jennifer influence coming through there. Um, farms that are already using EID and data collection so that they already knew how to collect all of this um, data and were making good use of it. Obviously open minded about the RAMs that uh, uh, we asked them to use and also uh, supplying Dumbia and Randall Parker so that we could track the data through the supply chain. Um, in terms of data collection, well, it, it starts at, uh, with sort of pregnancy scanning. So we're getting data from birth. We're monitoring traits like lambing ease, lamb survival, recording lamb mortality. Lambs are weighed at eight weeks of age and they're weighed again at about 90 days of age when we go on to farm all being well and do the ultrasound scanning for muscle and, and fat depth. Um, we'll also take a tissue sample at that time uh, which we can store for any future use. Um, animals are followed through to the abattoir, so collecting data on days to slaughter, carcass weights, confirmation and fat class, and then a subset of the lambs will go on for uh, meat quality work, assessing tenderness, and we also break down the primals so that we can look at primal yield. I think when we started this project, we aimed to get, I don't know, about 20, 25 lambs killed per sire. That would give us pretty good accuracies if we had a decent heritability. And we've absolutely smashed it in terms of those numbers. Most of the rams will have 50 plus, a few will have over, well over 100. It's a big data set, but it's a really strong data set for making good comparisons. And the other thing I should have said is that of the team of rams that have been used, some are natural service, but also we use a chunk of AI rams. So we're using frozen semen and that means that we can use the same rams in more than one farm. So the differences between farms can be taken into account within our analysis. That's a bit like the old sire reference schemes used to work. So the aims of RAM Compare is that we're interested in producing new estimated breeding values from carcass traits, looking at how heritable um, these attributes are, and that's been completed. So we're now just putting more data into those breeding values. Secondly, we were keen to compare recorded rams irrespective of breed and under commercial conditions to see whether animals re-ranked and also to show um, the strength um, uh, and, and strengthen and validate the new national terminal sire evaluation. So that was a new approach to our breeding evaluations that we developed last year. Um, and it's also shown us whether adding this extra commercial data in uh, to see what value that has in pedigree evaluations. We know many of the genetic evaluations across the world will utilize both pedigree and commercial data. And we wanted to have a look at that impact for ourselves. The final thing is to demonstrate the commercial value of recorded RAMs. Um, we've talked a lot about the financial impact of using superior genetics. It's nice to have real case studies to document that. And actually, if you go online, there's about 16 new case studies that have been written over recent months talking about uh, the impact of these sires within RAM Compare. So there's some bedtime reading for you uh, on the web. So that's where we are at this moment in time. Uh, when it comes to the next mating season, where, where do we go from here? Well, before I move on, it's probably worth highlighting that 2020 marks the final season of the second phase of the project. So we've done a two year and a three year project, and that takes us to five years worth of data collection. So the lambs that are currently being born, and we've got some May lambing flocks, so there will have been some today, they're some of the last within phase two of the project. I think everyone in the project recognizes and appreciates uh, what's been delivered to date in what's a relatively short time period for a, a genetics project, we've achieved a great deal. In Wales and Scotland, I know HCC and QMS were very keen to continue to support funding the project, and that's fantastic, and we're chatting to them about that. Uh, within AHDB, there's also tremendous support for RAM Compare, but having completed five years of data collection, I have been asked just to take a break and review the project, check it's in line with AHDB strategy, and also to demonstrate 
both the impact of the project at an industry level and the questions asked, how can we actually have a bigger impact within the industry from this work? So during uh, 2020 and 2021, there will be a break in the funded activity. However, recording will continue in Wales, uh, thanks to support from HCC. And thanks very much to the goodwill of the farmers involved. Five of the farms in England are actually going to continue to provide abattoir data for their existing rams. In addition to which, Bridget and I are going to try and beg, borrow and steal a few extras to use for natural service to complement those. So the sort of core of the data collection through the abattoirs, we're going to try and continue during the interim year as we create our new plans for the future. And in terms of talking about industry impact, um, the great news is that we've got some really good examples already through a couple of bolt-on projects that have been developed. Uh, one of those is Shaz Compare, and that's where a couple of Charolais breeders, um, Andrew Walton and Jamie Wilde, have got together. They wanted to get involved in the project, but wanted to actually test more rams faster and on a greater scale. So to do that, they've got a mule flock um, where we actually got the lambing today, I think, and we put uh, five or six hundred lambs on today, and they've done their own test. They use a reference ram provided by me. And so they can link fully into the project, collect the same information, and that data has been included within this year's results. So that's a really good example. You can read more about that online. Um, the other project that I've been involved with is working with the, the Dorset, Paul Dorset Centurion Group. Um, they're really interested in the carcass attributes of their breed. They get a lot of good feedback uh, through their abattoir, and they asked me to analyze that on a similar basis. I've been working with them, looking at exactly the same traits. But the important bit is that both of those projects ride on the back of the uh, work done through RAM Compare using the same blood models developed by eGenes up at SIUC, uh, and they've been able to benefit from the project in that way. So there are two really good additional projects. So what have uh, we learned this season? I guess it was a pilot project. So the first thing that we've learned is that it can be done. Uh, the abattoir derived information is under significant genetic influence and can be used in breeding programs and have a major impact on our current genetic evaluations. But what does it mean for the commercial RAM buyers? That's the important part uh, of RAM Compare. So we're gonna take a step back for a moment and firstly, we need to remind ourselves that RAM buyers are actually only selecting their RAMs on proxy traits. So I've shown three breeding values here, scan weight, muscle depth, and fat depth. In reality, there's over 20 if you include all of the growth and carcass traits and many of the new traits derived through the CT scanner. Um, but they're using these as predictors of the things they get paid on. So they will benefit from days to slaughter, uh, reducing those and they get paid directly on carcass weight, confirmation and fat class for those that are, are selling uh, in, on a dead weight basis. And indeed those attributes will still benefit those selling animals live weight. The question for RAM Compare was really tying the two together. It was updating our knowledge uh, of the relationship between abattoir traits and those traits measured in pedigree flocks. It was about demonstrating um, the, the link between the two and also improving the link between the two. If we can do a better job of predicting uh, the profitability of, of size in pedigree flocks using this abattoir data, then that's exactly what we should be doing. So that's really how the data has been pulled together. And we've got some nice information this year showing these relationships. So how do we actually assess um, the strength of relationships? Well, one way to do that is actually to look at the genetic merit of the sires for any given trait, the performance of their progeny for any given trait, look at the relationship between those two points. And if it's a nice tight relationship, then you can assume quite a high correlation between those attributes. If you look at those um, two predictors and there's no relationship at all, then it's an extremely low correlation and, and we don't see a link between the two. 
So broadly speaking, that's what we've done with the breeding values of the rams that have come onto test so far. And I guess I'm just going to be talking about this for the five numerically larger breeds. Uh, but actually, there's a whole range of breeds that have been involved, some for the first time this year, just testing the water and providing rams on test. So from a commercial point of view, what's the impact of selecting rams with high scanway TBVs? Uh, well, we can see that there's quite a strong link here between a ram scanway TBV and the growth potential that was observed in commercial farms of their progeny. Now, I realize these are early results and often with perhaps relatively small subsets of data. Um, when you look at the numbers of rams um, tested by each breed. However, where we see the similar relationship in several different breeds, well, then that indicates something important is taking place that we need to take into account. The other relationship that we see, and this is heading in the right direction, although it's a negative relationship, is between scan weight and days to slaughter. So high scan weight EBV sires are producing progeny that are finishing much more quickly. And finally, carcass weight. Now, the relationship with carcass weight tends to be weaker. Uh, and this may be because of the end point in the trial is at a, a fixed weight. So perhaps you don't see that full difference expressed. But the other factors that come in here are because of differences in muscling that we see uh, muscling and muscle yield both within and between breeds, effectively some differences in, in kill out. So that sometimes those with the fastest growth rates don't always have the highest carcass yield when these uh, uh, progeny are killed. What is clear is that the exploitation of high scan weight rams is tending to reduce days to slaughter, but it is also having a positive impact, generally speaking, uh, on, on carcass weight. And just as an aside, we often talk about when animals reach finish and at what weight. Although these are forage based systems, we didn't have large numbers of underfinished, very heavy lambs on any of these farms in any of these years. Lambs were finished nicely within spec. So here's an example from uh, down in Cornwall. This is Adrian and Lynn Coombe at Dewpath, which happens to be one of our strategic farms as well with AHDB. And you can see that there is a relationship there between a ram's scan weight and the carcass weight of his progeny. However, there's quite a bit of variation around that and plenty of noise because of the number of different breeds involved and some of the differences between them. If you contrast that with this chart showing days to slaughter, and this is on three of the farms, you can see that this relationship's much clearer. Um, the rams on these three quite different finishing systems. The higher scan weights meant lambs were leaving the farm earlier. And in some cases, that's two or three weeks earlier by certain sires. So each one of these points is a ram and uh, it's his genetic merit along the bottom. And it's the average performance of his progeny, often 40 or 50 lambs being plotted uh, along the Y axis. So that's the story about scan weight and growth. Now, I know not everyone loves a graph as much as my project uh, management team and the project partners, so I'll, I'll spare you hundreds of those. But we do see similar relationships when we look at the muscling traits. And by muscling traits, I mean uh, muscle depth, uh, lean weight of meat in the carcass and, and jigget shape, albeit that there's plenty of variation between breeds. And that might be for a number of reasons. Some of the uh, breeds may be more or less variable in terms of the rams they put on test, and also for the CT traits, uh, some breeds make more or less use of the CT scanner. But there is generally a good relationship there um, with the muscling traits. Quite a nice example from uh, actually last year's data set was uh, a ram used up with Mark Exelby up in Yorkshire. We have uh, two Charolais here, farm stock ram and a high EBV AI ram. Uh, this one came from uh, Neil Lawton's Lower Eye Flock in Montgomery. And you can see that they're very similar in terms of scan weight, but a big difference in their muscle depth EBVs. Now, we're expressing muscle depth uh, is now expressed on a weight-adjusted basis. That was one of the big changes 
we made to our analyses last year for all terminal sires. And that gives a much better prediction of muscling um, at a fixed weight. And the impact was quite striking when we looked at the distribution of um, confirmation uh, scores for these two particular rams with different muscling traits. So a nice example that actually this move to weight adjusted traits uh, is a move in the right direction. If we look at the breeding values that influence leanness, um, we've got a, a similar story. If anything, we've got a, a stronger relationship here between the breeding values for fat depth uh, and also the CT fat weight. So that's the, the total amount of fat in the carcass as determined using the CT scanner. And we can see here that clearly the fatter rams were tending to lead to progeny that uh, with a, a fatter fat classification. So if you put all of that information together, for the first time, we've got really sound information uh, or much sounder information on which to base selection decisions and to give advice to commercial producers. We now know much more about the impact of these traits on days to slaughter. We can see that actually the genetics to increase carcass weight are more complicated than perhaps we first thought. And maybe we should make better use of the CT scanner to actually assist in that aim. And it also shows the value of using ultrasound scanning to enhance carcass attributes uh, and the benefit of expressing those on a weight adjusted basis. So four years worth of data into a very simple table, but I'd argue quite a valuable one. So how useful is the carcass merit index? What we've actually done with the RAM compare data is pulled together the breeding values for carcass weight confirmation and fat classification. And they're um, pulled together into a in single individual breeding index to represent the overall value of a ram specifically for, for these carcass traits. So it doesn't take into account days to slaughter at the moment, but it does take into account the value of the lamb himself. And if we look at just the data from 2019, for all the different rams on all the different farms, and we look at the difference in their average progeny value to the other rams on the farm, we can see some quite important differences between sires, and we can see that the genetic merit of the rams has quite a lot to do with the variation that we see in the value of their lambs. And at either extreme, we've got some big differences, but very easily you can see a three pound fifty four pounds a lamb difference between um, some of the better and some of the lower performing sires and remember that we tended to have quite high performing rams coming through on test there were a few slightly lower farm stock rams but generally these are all quite high genetic merit recorded rams so there is some clear financial differences there if we uh, work that up, £3.50 a lamb benefit might not uh, sound a great deal. And of course, we are ignoring um, gains by reducing days to slaughter uh, in addition to that. But work it up over a ram's working lifetime. And I think I've been quite conservative here, talking about three working years uh, and only going to 60 years. But that's the best part of £900 a ram. That's easily an extra £900 that you could make purely by investing in rams with the right genetics. So how do we go about finding these rams? Uh, well, in a normal year, I'd talk about looking at sale cards and looking at charts at sales and chatting to breeders um, uh, about their reports uh, and, and getting the information directly from them. Um, but this year, things are probably gonna be slightly differently, certainly for the early sales. Um, lots of this information will be presented online, and there's a number of sites that you can go to for that information. Lots of breeders will be putting things up onto Facebook, and they can link in uh, the genetic merit of their animals directly from databases like Signet. Online auctions undoubtedly will have links in that show the genetic merit. So this year, maybe for the first time, many producers will be checking the breeding values online first. Uh, and then making arrangements to have a look at or obtain um, these uh, rams. 
a couple of small things that uh, we're involved with in Signet that, that might help. One of which is Flock Finder. So on the open access to anyone that wants to use it, put in a breed of interest in your postcode and it shows you who's actually got rams uh, in your area. So uh, in terms of finding out who's the closest, um, there's some information there and there's a link so you can see live animals in their flock and their breeding values. In addition to which, um, we've put up a sheep for sale site. That's very simple for breeders just to go through, tick the details of animals that they have for sale. They'll go online for a fixed point in time um, and then that can be refreshed. Uh, so they don't sit up there for years and years. That will constantly be updated. And actually I went on there, this is an old shot, but I went on there this morning and there's the best part of 370 rams and ewes currently for sale on the Signet website. So you can click a button for the breed of interest and that will download and drop into a spreadsheet for you to look at. So that's the starting point. The other bit that is quite nice about the new site is that breeders can create their own catalogues online. So you can go through, uh, highlight the animals that you wish to sell and it will produce a very simple catalogue. And I suspect that my pedigree clients will be emailing out a few of these to their uh, potential customers over the coming months. So a nice easy way to display the data. So that's a slight aside about some of the things that we've been working on. Um, for those that would like more information about the benefits, uh, there's a whole series of case studies, both from the point of view of the farmers involved in the project, and also from the point of view of people that have provided RAMs and have learned from the project uh, along the way. So this shows quite nicely the link between the use of performance RAMs, uh, recorded RAMs, and the, the progeny coming through the abattoir. So moving on to what for some will be the main event of the evening, which is just talking about the year four results. Uh, these are available online. Uh, we can send them to you as a PDF and all this information is up in the public domain. And while it's very exciting to know who the top RAM is for any given trait, particularly if you happen to be the person that um, bred it, um, there's more to the report than just uh, the ranking of these animals. The main thing is actually for commercial producers to know how to select similar animals and have confidence in making those selection decisions. So I think those are really the important messages that are coming out of this work. Take for example, this quick chart, which is showing the five biggest breeds and the apologies to some of the smaller breeds that are involved. Um, but what we're doing here is looking at their genetic attributes. And if we look at a trait, for example, such as scan weight, we can see that there's a massive overlap in their genetic potential. So within each of the breeds, there are some real stars out there in terms of growth rates. And in many ways, rather than getting het up on breed, uh, we should be focusing on um, finding out which are the, the highest ranking animals within a breed and selecting accordingly. Um, so we'll just talk about a few of the results for a moment. Uh, in terms of scan weight, the, this is just the 2019 rams that we've tested. Within the booklet, you'll see the all-time list as well as those tested in 2019. And obviously each time we update uh, our results, we will uh, we update all historic data as well. But for 2019, um, that we see that the meat link from George Fell has come top. Quite a few of us saw this ram as it happens at our open day in Yorkshire, up at Marks, uh, and we, we see him come top um, by quite a distance, uh, as it turns out, of the rankings. Queuing up behind him are a whole chunk of Suffolks um, on the list, and if you get hold of the full publication, I think you can see the top 15. Um, I thought I'll just show the top five or so on each of these. And there's a nice case study online um, if you want to read a bit more about what the, the, uh, this meat link ram has done in particular. When we talk about muscle depth on a, a weight adjusted basis, well, it's actually one of Richard Garner's autumn uh, bred Suffolks that's come out in pole position. Um, he's based in Horncastle 
And again, there's a nice online study. He's got over three decades worth of performance recording uh, behind him and the use of ultrasound scanning. And it's really paid off uh, this year. And again, on this particular table, it's the meat links that are queued up um, in amongst the Suffolk's. If we talk about uh, fat depth, I'm just showing the, the leaner sires here. Now, fat depth is one of those traits that we like to monitor. Uh, and it's mainly of interest if you've got lambs that are getting too fat at too light a weight. Um, that's where you would include it in your breeding objectives. So here we've got uh, Alan Jackson's uh, Texel from the Rugley flock uh, that's come top of this ranking. Uh, days to slaughter. This is a relatively new breeding value for the project. We've had it for just the last two years. And here you can see that that fast growing meat link has just been pipped to the post by the Hampshire Down that was bred by CM Branton Sons. So that was a ram that was used with Reese and Russell Edwards down in Wales. And actually he's got the genetic potential to get lambs away a couple of weeks earlier than the sort of average for rams on test. So that's quite a big difference um, particularly in an early lambing system or where you're trying to capitalize on slightly higher uh, early season prices. And you can read more about that online, I'm sure. When it comes to carcass weight, uh, we've got a ram here from uh, bred by Morris Hardy Bishop um, a couple of years ago. And he would like to remind you that it stood sixth at the Royal when I spoke to him this afternoon. It was a really good carcass uh, ram that, that he bred. That's come out on top for his uh, carcass weight. And we've got information, a uh, nice case study on Texels that you can read about um, online. For carcass confirmation, we've got a, a blue Texel from Jan Rodenberg um, that's come through uh, second overall. We've actually got Texel, Suffolk, and oh, no, we've got, uh, I'm on the wrong slide. We've got uh, various different breeds. Um, on this particular slide, we've actually got a Texel from Alwyn Phillips in second, and uh, some Beltex semen provided by Matt Prince has come through in, in third position in terms of carcass confirmation. If we move on to fat class, again, this is looking at the leaner size that we had on test and the top ranking ram here was one that was bred by um, Peter Mitchell and put forward by uh, Roger Helm. So that's come through as producing the leanest genetics uh, on RAM Compare in 2019. When we look at overall carcass merit, well, that's pulling together both carcass weight and confirmation in particular. And so it's not a big surprise to see that we've got the Texel and the blue Texel that came ranked so highly on those other two tables coming through as first and second on that list. So they've come through very highly amongst the best of the 2019 sires for overall carcass merit. Just remembering that this doesn't include uh, days to slaughter, which we look at separately. One of the special parts of the project was some of the work that we've done with primals. So here we've broken down the carcasses um, to look at the weight of the primals. And those are assessed on a, um, uh, a fixed uh, weight basis. So if all the carcasses were the same weight, which ones would have the most meat in the haunch, in the middle, so across the loin, and, and in the front of the carcass? In terms of haunch, you know, jigot weight, well, it's actually Robin Hume's, uh, one of his rams from his Easy Rams uh, breeding enterprise out in Shropshire that took the top spot for jigot weight. And that might not be such a surprise when you actually look at its EBVs uh, for Jigot. Robin uh, and his son Nick have been using the CT scanner for a number of years now, sending lots of their best breeding lines through the CT scanner, using them themselves. And it's really paid dividends um, this year with this particular individual. Um, Southdowns came on to the test for the first time this year. And it's actually a South Down from Rob Beaumont's Andersy flock that was top for weight uh, in the middle of the carcass, so through the loin. And uh, we've got a blue Texel from Charles Circum, um, which came through the top primal weight 
within the front of the carcass. So Charles, better known to us um, through the Charolais, uh, and actually here will have a major involvement next year through his Charolais because Dolby Ranieri is going to be our reference ram um, that we're using at, at this moment in time. So that's a bit of data with regard to primals. And again, the booklet will give you more information. And finally, back to the Charolais when it comes to shear force. So we've had this new breeding value for shear force for two years now. It's essentially looking at the tenderness of the meat. Um, we take a sample from the loin. It's frozen. Uh, and defrosted and cooked in a standardized manner, all of these samples. Um, and then we actually mechanically assess the degree of force that needs to go through that meat um, to get a, a shear force reading. Now, Charolais were topped last year uh, with Kanahar's Panache, provided by Robert Gregory and bred by Andrew Davies. And this year, um, uh, Crogham Lambert, provided by the Ingram family, and bred by Jonathan and Carol Barber up in Wyndham has actually come top and top by some margin as well. So that's been an interesting piece of work. And it's interesting because we can also go back to the database and look at which other factors we think might be influencing shear force. That work's not been done yet, but the data all sits there um, and exists. So in summary, um, I'm not sure this short presentation really does justice to the data that we have and you'll appreciate in some ways we're just at the, the very tip of analyzing this information but um, what we can see is that uh, it does greatly enhance the genetic evaluations that we have and it strongly shows the value of using high EBV rams uh, and that this can have a big impact uh, on farming businesses. So Chloe that's me done. Have there been any questions coming through? Thanks, Sam. Uh, yeah, we've got a few questions already. I'll um, I'll just give people a, another minute to to have a think. So we've gone through lots of lots of information there. Um, so I'll just remind you all that the presentation has been recorded, so it will be available on the Beef and Lamb YouTube channel. And also, you know, if there's a particular slide you'd like to go back to tonight, we've got enough time to go back to slides and and recap on anything that you've missed because we have gone through. Um, quite quickly. So Sam, we have got some questions already. Lovely. Um, so um, will the breeders um, who have taken part in the project, will they get the EBVs back on all of the rams that they've entered? Okay, um, the, the short answer is yes. For the um, traits that go directly into the genetic evaluations that we have at the moment, so scan weight, muscle depth, fat depth, of course they already see those. Those are already incorporated into the breeding values of their rams and they will have gone in as soon as the data arrived with a signet. So we're really talking about the um, carcass attributes. I'll have a think about how we do that um, because we'll do it all electronically. But yes, I'm sure that's something that can be done. If breeders are particularly keen to something, see something very quickly, uh, if there's, uh, then maybe just send me an email. But I'll try and do something for all the people that supplied rams, yeah. Thanks, Sam. Um, and the next one is, did any of the recorded stock re-rank following the use on commercial farms? Um, yes, is, is the short answer. Whenever you get new information coming into an analysis, there will be changes. Um, there would be some animals that exceeded our expectations and some that didn't perform quite as well as we expected. Generally for traits like scan weights, muscle depth and fat depth, where we'd already recorded the trait itself, that re-ranking was relatively small. There'd be the odd ram that uh, didn't perform in the manner that was expected. And, and saw their breeding values adjusted. For the very high accuracy AI rams, then the movement was, was much less. I think it's also fair to say that we would have had rams that maybe over or underperformed for things like days to slaughter or carcass confirmation that maybe we wouldn't have predicted purely by looking at just their scan weight or their muscle depth um, EBVs. So it shows it isn't an exact relationship and it shows that it is more useful having this extra 
information in the background. To what degree that re-ranking is due to them being tested in a different environment or just that it's new information that, that's come through um, is, is harder to say. Um, I was speculating with a breeder earlier in the week that actually the animals that are least likely to re-rank might be those that are treated under um, quite commercial environment and also that are scanned closer to that sort of 40 to 50 kilos mark when the ultrasound scanner um, comes out onto farm. But that's more speculation than, than fact, or I'm sure I can look into. Thanks, Sam. Um, we've got another one here. How did the ewes in the different flocks compare in terms of their breeding and were their own sires performance recorded? Right. Um, it wasn't really set out as a ewe compare comparison um, because the ewes genetic merit would be confounded with the farm. So you might have a farm that you know, has fantastic nutrition and forage and everything going for it um, and that lambs performed really well, that doesn't necessarily mean that it was the ewes that had fantastic genetic merit. It could have been the farm. So there's a ewe and farm confounding effect that uh, means that would be hard to pull apart. Um, the ewes tended to be relatively uniform on the farm, so it wasn't like we were comparing half of them Innovis genetics, half of them clins or half of them mules. Um, so that one was, was harder to, to uh, talk about. In most cases, the ewes weren't recorded and we didn't know about their sires. And that's part of the reason that you need big numbers so that each ram gets you know, 30, 40 ewes a piece. And on average, he might get some good ones and some less good ones in the group, but it averages itself out. You could probably make them to smaller numbers if you knew the genetic merit of the ewes. So we go for power of numbers to deal with that. Having said all of that, um, a couple of the clin flocks that we have recorded border software. And so we either knew about the use or we set up a pedigree for those use. And that data might become useful uh, within other clin or maternal analyses in the future. Thanks, Sam. And the next one here, will there still be a hard copy of the results posted out as in previous years? Um, at this moment, I'm not sure. It depends when we're going to get back to business as usual, when we can print. And at the point that we can print, will the results you know, be out of date? We'd normally be getting them ready for the big sheep event. Obviously, that's going to be later in the season. We might have different messages or more up to date results for that. So at this moment in time, the plan is to have it electronically. All the information is um up online and we've put the individual tables up online and i'm sure i can happily print a few copies for anyone um who would actually would would relish having that that paper version i might live to regret that offer um but that that might be the, the best approach um, because distributing the paper copies will be a bit harder this year Thanks, Sam. Um, and the next one is the number of progeny per sire varies quite a lot. So how is the accuracy percentage taken into account when producing the overall rank of each sire? OK, uh, that's a good question. Um, the accuracy figure purely reflects the number of um, records uh, behind an animal's breeding value. And you're right, it does vary um, between individuals. If you have rams that have very, very small progeny numbers, this is more common in a pedigree flock where you might just buy an in-lamb ewe and, and have a couple of lambs dropped uh, and we don't know anything else about the sire, then there's an element of which Blup starts to um, take that into account and regress the breeding values closer towards an average. In other words, you're not likely to come out with a massive sky high index on the basis of just two or three lambs. Bluff is a little bit risk averse and stops that from happening. Now, having said that, once you get to sort of 20 lambs plus, I would imagine, and I'm not a geneticist, but I would imagine the degree of regression is relatively small at that point, particularly for these very high heritability traits. So to be honest, you know, certainly once lambs have got 25, 30 lambs on the ground. It doesn't matter whether another one's got another 100. 
he doesn't get bonus points for the, that extra 100 and that extra accuracy. Um, so the animal with 100 or 200 lambs doesn't get inflated values on the basis of the extra information. It's just a much more accurate prediction of what's probably his true genetic merit. Thanks, Sam. And the next one is, can the large data set be used to also explore whether there are some traits or characteristics from the dam, so for example, breed, body condition, mature weight, that improve the correlation between on-farm traits and EBVs? Gosh, I promised to do lots of short answers tonight. I'm failing miserably, <laughs> aren't I? That's another good question. Um, let's have a think. The data can be used in a number of ways. Um, this isn't actually an answer, but one of the ways that we're actually using the data is to look at lamb survival. I've got some really nice work that I haven't presented tonight, um, breaking down the lambs based on their weight at eight weeks. And not only do those that are smaller eight weeks take much longer to reach slaughter, no great surprise there, I realize, um, but also you do see quite a sizable increase in mortality amongst lambs that were, you know, alive, viable, fine as they, well, small, but fine as they went over the way scales at eight weeks that just never materialized. So I think we're learning some interesting things about lamb survival. Your actual question was about body condition score and you weight. And you're right, we've collected a lot of that data as we've gone along, because if you're doing a project of this size, it makes sense to do. Um, I think that sort of data might help in projects like Challenge Sheep, which is another AHDB project, so it can be put to use there. And as we start to move towards updating our maternal breeding evaluations, I think that mature size data is going to be very useful in helping us to truly understand efficiency and model breeding indexes that lead to more efficient maternal lines. And funnily enough, I was writing about that this afternoon within a proposal. So I think there is a lot to be learned from the data that has been collected on these ewes, if nothing else to help us in some of our modeling work, uh, as much as producing genetic parameters, for example. Thanks, Sam. Uh, the next one we've got, are the primal weight EBVs adjusted to a standard weight? Yes, that's the way that we analyze them. Um, you have to adjust for either age or weight. Um, if you don't adjust for weight, then very simply, the animal with the biggest carcass has the biggest haunch, has the biggest middle, has the biggest front, has the biggest everything. It's just the biggest animal. Uh, so to get something new and understand a bit more about yield, um, then we weight adjust the breeding values um, for those particular primals. And so it's also fair to say that when you look at primals and when I'm sending breeders EBVs back for primals for their rams, you can't have it all. You can't be top for the amount of meat in the, or it's hard, I should say. It's hard to have the most amount of meat in the shoulder and the loin and the hind quarter because you're adjusting back to a fixed weight. So there's a tendency for those that have more meat in the hind quarter, for example, to have you know, less in the other areas of the carcass and vice versa. Thanks, Sam. And um, the lambs that are away before 90 days, are they ultrasound scanned? Um, they, let's have a think. The vast, vast majority have been. Um, we've got one farm where we've ultrasound scanned in two batches so they can get um, you know, where they've had a big draw of a couple of hundred lambs. There have been occasions when the farmers at their cost, I, I, I should add, have very kindly hung on to lambs, maybe a little bit longer than they would have wanted to, and so had a couple of heavy lambs in those first draws so that we can go through and scan. And typically when we're scanning, uh, there's someone there putting red dots on the head and those lambs get ultrasound scanned and go, uh, you know, we have a big draw the next day because we do want to capture as much data as possible. And I think that's what we've done in the majority of cases. If there are anywhere we haven't, well, then we've collected a scan weight and we've obviously gone on and ultrasound scanned hundreds of their brothers and sisters instead. Um, but I think in the vast majority of cases, certainly in the last three years, uh, we've, we've managed to get the lot. 
Thanks, Sam. And the next one is, why doesn't RAM Compare venture into looking at cost reduction by assessing maternal breed rams for the performance of their daughters as ewes and progeny as carcass lambs? Oh, well, I'd love to, but that's a, it's, a, it's a much, much bigger, more expensive and, and different project to do. I've certainly got the uh, enthusiasm uh, to, to do that. The challenge in doing what you, I guess you'd call you compare, which would be following all the females through, and, and that would be an approach certainly in Ireland that they would do, where they keep back the females and monitor those over time. But you do have to remember that's a different sort of breeding system over there, where they tend to have more terminal sire genetics in their ewe breeds, so it makes sense to do both. Whereas here we tend to have much clearer maternal breeds and terminal sire breeds. Um, but if you do head down that approach, then because the animals of interest are just, once you've done the carcass bit, are just the females, then you need twice as many lambs to be dropped. And actually, you don't want to keep all the females. So you maybe need three times as many lambs dropped per sire to get you the same accuracies. You then have to monitor those not just over that season, but over three or four years. And ideally, to follow you longevity all the way through. And once you've ramped up the numbers to do that, then you are either talking into the millions of pounds or you're talking about doing much, much fewer rams. Now, I think my challenge is if I had that millions of pounds to do a you compare, would I invest it in that way? Or would I say, right, we'll go genomic testing in all of our Exlana, Romney, Clin populations and spend all that money on the purebred pedigree ram breeders and collect more data in their flocks rather than creating a crossbred population to assess maternal performance. So I'm delighted by the enthusiasm in ram compare. The logical next question is always, are you going to do a you compare? But financially, it is a, a bigger challenge, although I'm sure there are plenty that would argue that there are even greater gains to be made um, where we can improve maternal traits. And we do do, I should say, we do a lot of work working with maternal breeds to improve maternal traits. Tonight's all about terminal sires, but do log on and have a look at the information that's available for traits like prolificacy, uh, lamb survival, maternal ability, which is genetics for milk production, all really important traits that you can influence through sire selection where you do keep back female replacement. Thanks, Sam. Uh, and you mentioned Ireland and we've got a question here. Are you planning to link the data directly to LAM plus data in Ireland? Um, we have an indirect link um, through some great work that we've done with AFBI in Northern Ireland. Uh, where we've had rams um, from, from across here and rams that have headed up from Ireland uh, and they've been tested together. It's sort of dipping toe in the water uh, time. Um, we have good collaborative links with our friends in Sheep Island uh, and, and talk about various collaborative projects. So I wouldn't rule anything out, but obviously to do any of this work generally requires funding. And the question is whether the greatest gain is to be able to compare sheep directly in Ireland and across here, or whether we should spend more money on genetic research within our own ram breeding um, populations. Thank you. Uh, and the next one is, should we still be breeding Charolais rams with more fat cover? Um, I don't know. I don't think we've looked at uh, lamb mortality and there isn't great differences between any of the breeds. We looked at lambing ease, and I was slightly nervous that there may be differences between the sires, and we haven't really picked that up. So I'm not seeing the direct links between any of the breeds and fat and lamb survival. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but from all the data sets that I'm looking at, I'm not seeing uh, that directly within our data sets. And we have chosen uh, not necessarily in any one breed, certainly in some of the continental breeds, we chose some very lean sires. I was more interested to see whether these carcasses would all go up to colossal weights and not finish. And we haven't seen that. So, you know, I, I don't think 
um, I would be necessarily chasing um, uh, either ultra leanness or particularly fatter animals. What we now have with our breeding value, of course, is a weight adjusted indicator of fat so that we can see exactly the fat levels at a fixed weight, i.e. the weight when lambs are drawn. And I think that gives us a much better indicator of fatter or leaner lines and will no doubt guide our decisions in the future. Thank you. Um, and who verifies the data that's entered for each ram and were there any anomalies after rams were tested through results from their progeny? Um, we, we do a couple of things. Um, one is very scientific, one is less scientific. So we have tissue samples and we, in the first years, we randomly sampled a few, which was fine. And we also looked at a few of the bits of primal um, uh, meat that came through and linked that all the way back, just as a double check that we haven't accidentally swapped any samples around when we were doing our tenderness work. And the additional check that we'll occasionally do is if there's something that looks suspicious. So all of the farmers swap the color heads of their rams um, after the first sort of mating period. So if you AI'd to a, a Suffolk, then those ewes get swept by a Texel um, and, and vice versa. So we do a lot of swapping of rams with different colored heads. And obviously, if you've got some that are very, very close to that changeover date, then there's potential for the odd error to be made. And occasionally when a lamb has come through the conveyor belt, Bridget and Frizz have had a look at it and said, we'll just check who the dad is. Um, it's a very, very small proportion on a study that's, go on Bridget, I better let you speak. How many lambs? I've caught her on the hop. There's about 12,000 lambs that we've tested in total in the project. So it, it's a relatively small proportion, but we are using uh, genomic testing to assess the true sire uh, where there's any doubt or dropping them from the project, to be honest, if we've got vast numbers from a particular sire, that's easily done. Thanks, Sam. Uh, and the next one is, are the ewes on the individual farms all the same breeds as they are 50% of the genetic makeup? And also, is there a possibility that Innovis terminal rams will be used in future years to compare against the traditional breeds in an unbiased trial? Um, we, the ewes tend to be of the same uh, breed. We have some that are you know, very clearly mules or um, Suffolk mules, uh, clins. We had a farm that had one Innovis strain and just because of the way their system works, swapped to another Innovis strain um, between the seasons, but that didn't matter from our data collection point of view. That was a farm where we tended to get the older ewes and, um, uh, you know, so towards the end of their life, so they just did a, did a swap over. Um, but, you know, generally speaking, there isn't variation amongst the ewes on the farm. Um, will we test Innovis rams? Uh, well, we started this trial from the point of view of wanting rams that we knew something about. Um, so we were only choosing them from signet recorded flocks because we had that data set. Uh, I think over time we might extend it to test rams from other sources if there's an appetite to do that. Um, and uh, we can make that data available. That, I guess that's a question for phase three. Thanks, Sam. Um, and the next one is, how much influence did the F1 effect have on the latest EBVs for the rams entered into the project, especially when, com when compared to their pedigree siblings? Um, it, it's a good question, and it would be really important if we were comparing purebreds and first crosses on the same farm. Um, but the reality is that they all have the same amount of hybrid vigor um, on an individual farm. So it's a very good point. All of these lambs have hybrid vigor. Um, actually, in our terminal sire analysis, we can now take hybrid vigor into, into account, which is a, a story for another day. But it, it doesn't create bias. If you had a flock of Suffolks and then you started 
recording some Suffolk cross mules in the same flock at the same time, then we'd be having a discussion about hybrid vigor uh, and, and maybe even putting them into different management groups. But because on each of these farms, every lamb benefits from hybrid vigor, then it, it's not a problem in terms of bias. Thanks, Sam. Uh, we've just got a comment from Bridget um, regarding the previous question that a maximum of 40 lambs on a farm have been set as the unknown where the sire has become uncertain. There we go. She does know everything. I knew she'd know. Thank you, Bridget. And um, the next one is how much of a ram's EBV is driven by the EBV of his parentage versus actual weights and scan data? Hang on, I'm looking at Bridget's other comments. She says not set excluded. So I think that just means those have been dropped from the, the trial. Anyway, I won't add, add to the confusion further. What was the next question? Sorry, Chloe. Um, how much of a ram's EBV is driven by the EBV of his parentage versus actual weights and scan data? Um, gosh, another good question. Um, and another non-answer. It varies tremendously over time and with the trait. So obviously a ram with no progeny um, and no records himself is purely based on his parents. He effectively has EBVs that are mid-parent average. Um, once he has measurements himself, then if the traits are relatively high heritability, like growth and carcass traits tend to be, then that has quite a big influence. If the traits have a lower heritability, then his uh, relatives will have much more influence on his breeding values. So for example, um, if we're talking about prolificacy, whether he's a single or a twin doesn't have a huge impact if in the back pedigree, there's hundreds of singles or hundreds of twins produced by all the female breeding lines. So the heritability of the trait has a bit of a bearing as to how much the individual's performance influences breeding values relative to his ancestors. And then the next level of complexity is as soon as the progeny come along. And once you start getting progeny records, again, depending on the heritability of the trait, but the more records that exist, the less it matters what he actually did and what his ancestors did. So arguably, once you get 30, 40, 50 lambs on the ground in a flock where there's another four, five, six hundred, so there's a big contemporary group, then that pretty much settles where that animal is, is going to sit, I, I like to think. Um, and certainly these animals, as you probably know, that have 100 lambs on the ground, you, know, you could wipe their own performance record and it wouldn't actually affect their EBVs because their breeding values are being driven by those progeny. I don't have exact numbers. The, the clever people, the geneticists, can give you graphs um, that, that would give you a bit more data on that. Thanks, Sam. And will it be possible to have accurate EBVs for crosses of the breeds? For crosses of the breeds? Well, within our terminal sire evaluation, we're, we're now working on a mixed breed model. So we have heterosis that's built in. So if you have two recorded parents of different breeds, then you do get accurate breeding values now. We take hybrid vigor into account. So to an extent, there's an element of discounting their actual physical performance, so the breeding values aren't artificially inflated. And so you do get accurate breeding values to those animals. So I can think of a, a few softex breeders uh, that we work with. And because we know about both sides of the pedigree, um, then they do get accurate um, EBVs for crossbred animals. Uh, it becomes a little more difficult if one of the parents is unknown or non-recorded. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we have a prediction, but um, that will always tend to have lower accuracy values and be scaled back uh, where you might be sweeping with a, a, a ram of a less well-recorded breed, says he delicately. Thanks, Sam. And how will the lack of ultrasound and CT scanning in 2020 affect EBVs in the pedigree flocks, please? Yeah, it, it, it's an important question. Um, it, we have been here before, of course. We've, we've had this sadly in foot and mouth year where we were not able to collect the data. 
Um, in most pedigree flocks, we've got a tremendous amount of back data, so we can make reasonably good predictions. And then to complement that, we'll have lots of weight records coming in from the farms. So I think you can still buy weight recorded uh, rams with confidence. The reality is that a few of those stars that we might have been interested in aren't going to shine and stand out from the group as well without the ultrasound data. Now, based on breeders' knowledge, I suspect those lambs are being spotted and will be used this year. And actually, there might be more um, ram lambs used this year if trading rams is more, more difficult in pedigree flocks. And of course, as soon as they get progeny on the ground, scan the following year, then very quickly their, their breeding values go to exactly where they should be with the right level of accuracy. Um, but uh, it, it's something that we have lived with in the past and the wheels don't come off our analyses without that data, but it is just disappointing. And, and the same goes for CT scanning as well. People have some big CT programs that will be, uh, be tricky. Thanks, Sam. And uh, we've got one here. Why do we see such a marked difference in prediction of carcass weight versus growth rate for the lamb growth EBV? And is that growth EBV any use when it has a weak relationship with carcass weight? Yeah, it, it, it's a good question. And it, it's one we've been thinking about a lot. There was a logic at the start of this project that I just assumed big, fast growth rates, great big carcasses. But that tends not to be the case. And I think it, it is to do with issues about muscling in the carcass um, and yield. Um, that, that certainly is, is a factor. I think it, it might partly be just due to the way that um, within this trial in particular, the way that we were drawing lambs, they don't necessarily express all of their variation that would be possible in carcass weight. Uh, in many cases, it'd be expressed in terms of um, a reduction in terms of days to slaughter, and we see it expressed in that way. Possibly in a experimental trial where your end point was kill animals on a fixed age rather than when they're the right weight and finish, you might get a slightly different result. But having said that, I think I wouldn't use scan weight in isolation to improve carcass weight. I would take more notice now of the other muscling traits and work them together. And that's what breeding indexes try and do, pulling together information from several traits at once. Uh, and I think over time, as we review breeding indexes, we can take that into account. Thanks, Sam. And how does the overall index weigh up the benefit of reduced days to slaughter against carcass traits? Um, well, it doesn't at the moment. Um, that's a, a piece of uh, a final piece of research work that we're working on. I guess it's going to be done on economic grounds. Um, and the nice thing is all those things have an economic value that we can assess. It's sometimes hard to work out the economic value of increasing maternal ability by a kilo. You know, what's a kilo of extra milk production from a ewe worth? But we do know what a, a kilo of lamb um, at, you know, R3L lamb is worth, and we can work out um, the value of reducing days to slaughter, albeit it's a bit more complicated because it's a story about um, feed saved um, uh, and, and other resources that are reduced, and obviously a reduced grazing pressure on the farm then means that other lambs perform better themselves later on. So it is complicated but not beyond those that create these economic indexes. And the weighting would then be, uh, I would hope, on a, an economic basis. Thanks, Sam. We've just got a couple more to go through. Um, has any decision been taken on the, the RAM Compare Open days yet? Um, I think it has, and I think that they won't be taking place this year. Um, we're chatting to the farmers and I think we would prefer to have them at the right time of year, but in a different year. Uh, and so we're planning to hold them next year. If the farms are willing to have us, uh, and then uh, that's the plan to move them into next year rather than having them at the wrong time of year from a, a ram buying perspective. Thanks, Sam. And in the primal data, which cut has the most impact on overall carcass value? Um, 
I don't know. I don't know. I would, I have a rough idea about the kilograms of meat in each of those areas, and I'm sure I can get some values for that meat. We'd have to decide to whom, um, whether that's at the retailer level or elsewhere within the supply chain, and we could do those sums. Um, we always talk about the most expensive bit being the loin, because that sells for the high, tends to sell for the highest value per kilo. But obviously, you get a different number of kilos and different variation in kilos in the loin than you do in the, the haunch, for example. So um, I don't know that I have the answer to that. Thanks, Alan. We've just got a question. comment. Just got a comment from uh, Bridget to say that semen is available for all pedigree breeders free of charge if they, if they wish to link to Ram Compare. That's an excellent point. Thank you for reminding us, Bridget. And in fact, quite a few breeders have done in the past. Um, they played along at home. And as Bridget says here, that's how Shaz Compare got started uh, through the, the use of, of semen that we had available. We took a bit of extra from uh, some of our rams. So, um, yeah. Good idea. Um, and what are the next steps, Sam? How will you roll this out to the wider sheep industry? Um, I guess there's various processes. Um, the short term is about programmes like tonight through the webinar, through the case studies that have been written up and working with the KE and the comms teams to get these messages into other AHDB related activities and exactly the same as HCC and QMS will be doing to explain the, the pound, shilling and pence story behind genetics. So that's in the in the short term. Um, longer term, obviously, there's a review to be done of the project and a plan for the next phase and elements of discussion with industry about where we go in terms of um, collecting carcass data. I'm interested to know how many of my other pedigree breeders, for example, might have commercial data that they would want to build into breeding programs. Equally, and maybe more ambitious, but in the, um, the beef side of things, we already harness abattoir-derived carcass traits through um, national databases using BCMS data uh, and abattoir-derived data. And you could see on a longer-term picture that um, abattoir data could be used in a similar way for sheep, albeit I fully, fully recognize there is less single sire mating uh, and obviously less data in terms of date, date, uh, um, dates of birth, example, for example. But there, there are things there that we should have a look at. But in the short term, it's about getting these messages out uh, more widely. Thanks, Sam. The next one is, is intramuscular fat good for flavour? Um, we think that it is. Um, that's probably from other work as opposed to the RAM compare work. Um, and there would be some good data behind that. Um, and intramuscular fat is obviously something that we're now measuring through the CT scanner. So it's a proxy trait. CT looks at density. And so we have predictions of, of intramuscular fat. I've had a very quick and dirty look to see if I can pull up any relationships with um, the tenderness that we were looking at through shear force. And just me as a complete amateur playing in Excel, it isn't jumping out at me. They are different traits. Um, and uh, sort of the experts on on CT would probably say, well, you shouldn't have expected that, Sam. So um, AHDB funded um, Neil Cleland up at SIUC to do some great work on uh, intramuscular fat within the, the CT. And he was very much the expert in that area. So if you're interested, dig out some of his papers online and uh, you'll be better informed than me, I suspect. Thanks, Sam. Um, and is semen available for pedigree breeders in Northern Ireland? The challenge is getting it across. Um, we haven't frozen for exports. That, that wasn't the initial intention. And so I don't think we're allowed to send it across to Northern Ireland. Um, uh, so that would be the challenge there. Thank Bridget you. Says, um, yes not EU export, <laughs> I'm afraid. 
Thanks, Bev. We've just got a couple more questions left. Um, why have rams with more than 25 progeny, if it's if it's accurate at 25? Yeah, why, why bother? Um, well, the, the short answer is it was additional free data. Um, we set the farmers' targets to get you know, 25, 30 lambs per sire. Quite often they said, well, I've got more ewes, Sam. Um, I'm quite happy to send you the abattoir data for those. If you want the lambing, we'll collect it. Um, and of course, I was delighted. The great thing about using rams over more than one year is that you can um, build linkage between the years and it makes a much stronger analysis. A bit of you might say, well, actually, why didn't you just give them another ram? They got the spare use. Let's get more rams tested. Let's ramp things up. The challenge with that is sometimes the limitation is the number of single sire mating groups that you can actually run on a farm. Um, some of these farmers, although they'll do anything to help us, we have slight sense of humor failure once they get up to sort of their you know, ninth and tenth single sire mating group that they need to check every day to make sure nobody's jumped the fence. So uh, it does make for a really robust data set um, where we have these very high numbers. And so that's been useful in, in, in a different way. Thanks, Sam. Um, and we have come to the end of the questions. We have just got a comment here to say that the highest value cut per kilo is the loin, as you've said. So increasing loin weight against other parts would increase carcass value to the processor. Yeah, that would that would make sense if you could increase them by the same amount at the same speed. So if you've got the choice to increase any of them by, let's say, half a kilo, then, yeah, absolutely. Go for the, the most expensive one. Um, I think you just have to look at the genetic variation that exists in each of those points to see if that's a fair comparison. But no, I think you're quite right. Thanks very much, Sam. Um, we have got a couple of comments left, which we will get back to you individually in the interest of time this evening. Um, so I'd like to thank, thank Sam and Bridget very much for your time this evening. And thank you to everyone at home for listening. And we've had we've had lots of brilliant questions and comments. Um, so the presentation, thank you very much. Thanks, Sam. Um, thank so the presentation bye bye. has been recorded. It will be on the YouTube channel along with other previous webinars. And it will also be emailed shortly as well. So thanks again and enjoy the rest of your evenings, everyone.